with its history going as far back as 192 years. Now, there's been a lot of focus on modernization and indigenization of uh, Indian Army's artillery regiment uh, in the recent past. So today we will talk about these aspects uh, and for uh, little more on these aspects, we have with us a distinguished panel of guests uh, here in the School of Artillery in Devlali. Let me first introduce them to you, beginning with Lieutenant General R.S. Sararia, the Commandant of uh, School of uh, Artillery here in Devlali. We also have with us uh, Major General A.K. Chandan, Head of the Army Design Bureau with us, uh, and uh, Retired Lieutenant General Vinod Bhatia, Director for uh, Centre for Joint Warfare Studies. And we're also joined by Mr. Vijay Mittal, the DDG Weapons uh, from OFP, that's Ordnance Factory Board. So let's begin our discussion and let's try and understand a bit more about the artillery regiment, uh, the weapons it has and the modernization or the indigenization program, which is under a lot of focus. Let's begin with General Salaria here. General Salaria, let's, for our viewers' sake, you know, starting from the glorious history, the glorious past of the artillery regiment, the kind of weapons or weapon platforms which the artillery regiment has and the gradual shift in the 21st century as per the needs of the technology and uh, you know the uh, warfare demands as well yeah you know uh, we've had a very glorious past the regiment of artillery uh, was raised as you know in uh, 1827 way back almost 192 years back and uh, we have a very glorious uh, history very rich traditions uh, under the uh, royal british army initially uh, we did wonders in the first world war in both the world wars and post uh, independence, because of the bifurcation of assets between us and uh, our, our neighbor, mm -hmm. uh, we had to rebuild our artillery. We started off on a very small scale, uh, from the simple uh, 25 pounder gun, uh, guns like uh, 100 mm gun, 130 mm gun. We uh, started building up uh, post independence, and simultaneously, while we were building up uh, our uh, units and also our equipment which were mostly at that time of foreign origin mm -hmm. we fought very valiantly in all the wars starting from 1948 62 65 post the 62 and the 65 operations uh, uh, we learned a lot of lessons and that is the time when we embarked seriously upon uh, our own building up our own capabilities mm -hmm. and uh, if you recall uh, our first Indian gun was the 75-24 mountain gun, which was uh, conceptualized and designed by Brigadier Gurdayal Singh here only in School of Artillery, mm -hmm. somewhere in the in the late uh, 60s. And this is the gun which uh, uh, proved its uh, worth in in various uh, operations, especially the 71 war. Okay. So that that was uh, the first uh, uh, touch of our uh, Indianization. Mm -hmm. And thereafter, we have not uh, looked back. Though we still uh, kept building up our uh, artillery uh, through foreign sources and again fought the Sentinel War and of course the, 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 the top of the pack was the, the Kargil operations mm -hmm. where armed with the Bofors guns, the gunners really proved their worth in the, in the Kargil operations and gave a bloody nose to the uh, enemy. But by this time, somewhere in the late uh, 90s, uh, we embarked upon a very serious uh, indigenization drive. Okay. And this is a time that our uh, uh, local defense industry, the industrial base, started building it, uh, building it uh, itself up. Mm -hmm. And uh, the moment the, we saw the turn of the century, uh, we saw induction of a lot of modern uh, equipment, a lot of 155mm uh, uh, caliber guns. Uh, we switched over to mediumization. We got uh, long-range vectors like the uh, our own Indian Pinaka rocket system. Mm -hmm. Of course, we also had the Indo-Russian uh, BrahMos missile system and also the Smurge system. Okay. But then the the degree of the uh, Indianization started uh, through the Make in India initiative, and today we are uh, standing uh, at a point where we are fully armed, having a very versatile mix of both uh, uh, Indian make guns and also the older foreign make guns. Okay. Uh, we have a wide variety of uh, field guns, like our uh, good old 105mm uh, Indian field gun and the light field gun. We have our mortars. Uh, we have uh, the 155mm Bofors, 130mm gun, which is a very old Russian gun, but still uh, proving its worth. And also, uh, we have gone in for the ultralight hordes very recently, and also the K9 Vajra self-propelled gun. Mm -hmm. The Indian guns 
which are in the immediate pipeline are the, the Dhanush guns which have been developed very beautifully by the Ordnance uh, Field uh, 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 Ordnance uh, Factory Board. Mm -hmm. And also a lot of uh, guns are in pipeline like the Sharang which is an upgun uh, version of the 130mm gun. 130. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, equipment of surveillance like uh, Swati weapon looking radar which is already operationalized. So as of now we are in a, uh, in a, in a, uh, at a point where we have started receiving these state of the art uh, guns and uh, we uh, uh, are looking forward to a very, very bright future. Okay, so, so it, is, it has been a very, uh, you know, uh, interesting journey if you look at and let me bring in uh, General Bhatia here from 25 pounders to the versatile mix as uh, General Slavia pointed out uh, and quite a lot of, uh, you know, equipments which are being inducted right now. But if you look at the strategic aspect as well, before we move on to the weapon systems and the modernization and all that, why is it that artillery is that important, you know? It, it, it's, it's the second largest uh, force as far as, uh, in, in terms of strength, Indian Army is concerned after infantry, but it seems to be uh, very, very important. Yeah, the artillery is a battle winning factor. Uh, the infantry moves because the artillery is there, because the artillery is, artillery is the god of war. The infantry soldier is there at the target, at the objective, he raises the flag, uh, but he's supported by all other elements and artillery is an integral part, it's a battle winning factor and that is why I think it is very essential uh, that we ensure uh, effective modernization, effective capability building. You see, I must also say uh, what Jens Lari is absolutely right, but Vishal, the artillery modernization suffered to some extent for about two to three decades. It's only now in the last few years that we are actually in the takeoff stage. Uh, we are getting in uh, new guns and they're indigenous also. Uh, we are also getting in uh, the, uh, the unmanned autonomous systems. Mm -hmm. uh, we are getting in surveillance and target acquisition uh, 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 equipment also. Okay. So uh, emanations, uh, uh, that is also there. So it is, uh, it is all uh, encompassing, it's all, you know, we've got to harmonize everything and uh, we have the best gunners, let me say that. And uh, Cargill proved it. Uh, Cargill victory was owed uh, as much to the infantryman who climbed that and the junior leaders as much to the gunners because they were the ones who, who actually saturated the target and made sure that we recaptured those heights. It is nearly impossible. Speaking to some of the defense attaches later on, mm -hmm. and I was there during that time, they said, oh, oh my God, how can anyone go and capture these heights? And that is what the Indian soldiers did, and that is what the artillery helped uh, India do, recapture those heights. So I think artillery modernization is exceedingly important. It is a battle-winning factor, and we should make sure that we have an effective, combat-effective artillery, and hats off to them for the professionalism. Uh, we are standing in the School of Artillery, and I must say that uh, it is a professional arm, the sword arm, and the very best of them. Okay, very best professional arm of the Indian Army. Let's uh, now bring in uh, the gentlemen who are uh, working on the indigenization and uh, the Make in India aspect. Uh, General Channan and Mr. Mitchell out there from OFB. Let me begin with you, General Channan, in terms of, uh, you know, how it began, the, the, the idea that we should be self-reliant, obviously we can't always depend upon uh, you know, the foreign suppliers, uh, although as uh, Jan Salaria pointed out, it's a versatile mix right now, but a lot is uh, uh, you know, the indigenization, is through the indigenization process, make in India process. So where are we right now and what is being done? Look, uh, as far as the make in India process is concerned, it started, the policies actually started coming up about in 2001-2002 after the Cargill war but in true spirit you know the uh, entire policy shift actually happened after 2014 mm -hmm. and it is during this period that uh, we started trying to create indigenous uh, technologies here. The entire make in India uh, is not really manufactured in India, it is basically sitting on six major pillars. Okay. You have to make technology in India. Mm -hmm. You will have to ensure that the designs and the IPRs are rested here in India. You have to make sure that there is a manufacturing ecosystem which comes. Because defense by itself is a monosopy, so there are very few buyers. And therefore you have to make sure that that ecosystem comes in place. Mm -hmm. You need to have large OEMs who understand the business of defense, who leverage uh, the entire ecosystem and who provide the right umbrella then you need a certification and a testing system in place. Then, of course, defense equipment is very robust equipment. It remains in service for so many years. So you need to have a very, very uh, robust and a very sustainable channel okay. of logistic support and sustenance through the ages. The defense equipment mixes over 30, 40, 30. That means 30 legacy equipment, 40 current technologies and about 30 state of art. 
you need to make sure that all these equipment talk to each other and they fight as a the, the, the integration. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that is all that we are trying to do as far as the Army Design Bureau is concerned. Okay. L l let me bring in, you spoke about the ecosystem, the entire ecosystem which has to be in place and which is being worked upon when we talk about indigenization. Uh, Mr. Mittal is here from the uh, OFE, that's Ordnance Factory Board. Uh, Mr. Mittal, if you look at uh, the way OFB has worked on uh, different guns, even if we talk about Dhanush or the latest in edition Sharang, which Jan Salaria was also mentioning, the, the upgun version. Uh, so where are we once again, you know, in terms of what OFB is doing of providing the artillery with the indigenized weapons? Uh, OFB is now a 219 years old organization starting from 1801 to 2020. Uh, we have grown from one factory to 41 factories today. Mm -hmm. And we are making more than 600 types of end products majorly fulfilling the requirement of our uh, land forces. We make from uh, tents to tanks as we, as we call it, from uh, simple uh, technical designs to most modern state of the art technologies. If we talk of artillery gun systems as uh, General Saralia very rightly brought out, that uh, the country realized that we just cannot depend on the TOTs and taking by buy out, buying out equipments from uh, imported ones. The reason being very simple as General Chan Chan Chanan also tried to bring out that the life cycle of a product is quite long. Mm -hmm. And if you take a TOT, you, know only, you only get a know-how. You cannot add on to that product. You have to remain dependent on the OEM. You don't have those patent rights with you. So therefore, in case you want to do improvement, you want to in turn export of some of your manufactured products, you have to take go to the uh, uh, OEM every time to take his permission. So this idea of developing our own gun systems uh, came right in 1970s when a gun development team was formed and uh, 105 mm which was the standard uh, caliber at that point of time mm -hmm. uh, uh, Indian field gun and a light field gun was uh, uh, manufactured thereafter the world switched over to 155 uh, mm gun systems mm. India somehow did not and we uh, inducted Bofors guns okay. but since the, that process also did not move in terms of taking or absorbing the technology in Ordnance Factory Board, mm -hmm. uh, we got this idea and the mandate simultaneously. That's a, that's a great part of it. That in 2006, Ordnance Factory Board itself was given the mandate that you cannot continue to survive just being a manufacturing organization. You being the manufacturer, you know what the process uh, involves. It is you perhaps are the best suited people to upgrade an existing equipment and also for yourself no uh, uh, change yourself from just know how to know why in developing a system okay and this was at that time that whatever uh, knowledge we had acquired over the past 50 years in making more than thousand numbers of uh, lfgs and ifg guns and supplied to uh, indian Ar uh, army uh, especially the artillery centers mm -hmm. uh, we built upon that we opened our ordnance development center in kanpur got the uh, necessary required uh, design, trained our engineers in UK, more than 100 engineers today from OFB are trained in various uh, defense fields and they can design anything uh, of, the, of the land system times and that is how we came up with an idea in association with the school of RT in a pooled manner, resourcing all the pool, pooling all the resources of the uh, country, be it a uh, 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 user as RT wing, be it a DGQA, be it a DRDO, be it the private industry and OFB okay. pulled all the resources, came out with this uh, idea of synergizing the effects and we thought of building up from where the Beauforts had left to a 155 into 45 caliber gun system Dhanush which will not only be much state of the art than Beauforts but also gave us a tactical advantage of having a range in excess of 10 kilometers of what Beaufort was having. Mm -hmm. Like if Beaufort had a range of say 27, 28 kilometers, Dhanush will give us a range of uh, 38 kilometers. Okay. And with the support of uh, all the users of firing it uh, n number of times, uh, we could finally realize a gun which, uh, which the whole world is applauding us today as uh, a, a, a Indian defense system and MOD that we could come out by synergizing all our efforts to a gun system which uh, the whole country is uh, surprised that India has come out with a gun system which is state of the art and comparable to any gun system in the world. Okay. And coming to the Sharang which uh, uh, Sir was saying just now, it was a brilliant idea of whoever devised it. 
that we have a heavy structure of 130 mm gun and with the kind of technology we have acquired with the kind of design uh, knowledge we have done why not per, mix them per, both perhaps and come we, up with a perhaps new... we can build up a 155 gun on a most economic solution and in the latest df expo 2020 what we had from 5th to 8th of february uh, honorable rm has handed over the uh, first batch of guns to uh, uh, indian army okay. and we came out with a most economic solution and the best solution perhaps which could be which could have been done okay again just a point in the dhanush that dhanush had become the most tried gun systems firing more than 4500 rounds in various uh, uh, locations of mm -hmm. the uh, country to prove its versatility and prove its metal okay so that explains what oap has been doing uh, but you mentioned uh, mr mitchell the end user point and let me go back to the end user here you know general salaria from your point of view and from the artillery regiment's point of view the way entire uh, modernization program is moving ahead or the indigenization program is moving ahead both uh, in terms of uh, you know firepower in terms of range in terms of technology as an end user the artillery regiment uh, believes that it's it uh, you know fulfills the response uh, requirements of the artillery regiment or there's a room for more to be done be it in technology or maybe in platform or firepower and further improvements can be made yeah you see uh, the the worth and competence of any artillery force in, in this world depends on five factors range accuracy lethality mobility and survivability the way our uh, uh, program is uh, on and today after today's seminar where we had a direct interaction with uh, the uh, the reps of our defense industry we are fully confident that we are going in the right direction so as far as the range mm -hmm. part is concerned and the accuracy part is concerned and the mobility part is concerned uh, and even the uh, the uh, the survivability uh, we are doing pretty well uh, the, uh, the the way the guns are coming in these guns today have enhanced the reach uh, to almost uh, 40 to 50 kilometers and we are now aspiring for 70 kilometers. Mm -hmm. The rockets are touching 90 to 100. Missiles have gone even further, which means that today artillery can straddle the tactical, the operational and the strategic spheres simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But now to uh, do this, uh, to uh, 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 exploit this capability of ours, we need to now just focus on two more things. Mm -hmm. We have reached some, uh, somehow, the, you can't push the range of the ranges of the guns any further. Okay. We don't need to focus now on our ammunition. We need to develop uh, uh, precision guided munitions, which increase our lethality also, and also maybe the range uh, to a, a better extent. Okay. And once we get these uh, precise precision guided munitions, uh, because they are very costly, we will have to then work out a, a scaling, a right mix of the conventional ammunition and the and the precision and ammunition. Precision because it's, it's very costly. Uh -huh. Simultaneously, having now uh, got all this uh, uh, power with us, we have to now. Uh, exploited with long range surveillance and targeting capability. So uh, there we need to focus a bit more so that we are able to uh, look deeper more effectively mm -hmm. and this so called sensor to shooter link is able to uh, operate very very effectively. Okay. These are two things we need to focus okay. on. So these two areas, Jan Chanan, on these two areas, you know, the uh, precision ammunition as well as uh, surveillance capabilities, the focus uh, as uh, you know, the, from the end user's perspective, that is where the focus needs to be. So on these two areas, how are we moving ahead? Okay. As far as the precision capability is concerned, uh, we have, till the time we acquire these capabilities substantially so that they can actually become effective battle-worthy uh, uh, equipment, we are in the interim actually trying to acquire this capability to, through minimal imports mm -hmm. like the Excalibur ammunition, the PGK kits. But at the same time, there are a number of initiatives that have been taken i deal with the drdo from the army side we are doing the uh, uh, some project as far as the precision guided rockets is concerned mm -hmm. we are doing one with drdo it's moving very well then we are also looking at course correction fuses precision guided munitions terminally guided munitions as uh, technology development projects through the army technology board and the technology development fund and these projects are moving on their own trajectories okay uh, this is as far as the precision is concerned the second thing is the persistence mm -hmm. uh, that is again an area so the area of loiter munitions where actually uh, a munition can move out 
be persistent on a, on a target mm -hmm. and subsequently depending on the uh, cost benefit or the payoff it can attack a